Good evening. My name is Shelby Friedell, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues. On behalf of the Clark Forum, Dickinson College, the Department of Political Science, and the Churchill Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, U.S. War Powers. <clears throat> in the past decade, the United States has engaged in many military operations for the express purposes of national and international security, including the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the bombing of Libya, and the ongoing, air, ongoing attacks on ISIS. Some of these operations have been conducted without a declaration of war or explicit approval from Congress. The panel tonight will address recent U.S. commitments of military force and explore the related domestic and international legal and political implications. Today's panel discussion is very timely because on Tuesday, the Obama administration proposed a new authorization for the use of force, military force, to fight ISIS. The proposal comes six months after U.S. airstrikes against ISIS began. What does the timing of the new AUMF say about the nature of U.S. war powers? Our panel is composed of Amy Godian, the Assistant Dean for Academic Affairs at the Penn State Dickinson School of Law, Douglas Lovelace, Jr., the Director of the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute, and and Andrew Rudolevich, the Thomas Brackett Reed Professor of Government at Bowdoin College. The moderator for tonight's event, Douglas Stewart, is the first holder of the J. William and Helen D. Stewart Chair in the International Studies at Dickinson College and an adjunct re research professor at the U.S. Army War College. At this time, I'd like to ask that you please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. A question and answer session will follow the panel discussion, so please hold all questions until then. Now, please join me in welcoming our panelists and the moderator for tonight's panel, Professor Douglas Stewart. Thank you, Shelby. <laughs> I recently, in the middle of my seminar, when I was discussing the 9-11 uh, crisis, the 9-11 uh, situation, um, this thing rang. And when I pulled it out of my pocket and flipped it open, one of the students said, speaking of 2001. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the great French diplomat, uh, Prince Talleyrand, once observed that treason is a matter of dates. The same can be said for event planning. And as Shelby just, noted, just pointed out, um, the, the Clark Forum was extremely prescient, uh, brilliant, in <laughs> assessing when the uh, Obama administration would be making its case to Congress for uh, the uh, AUMF uh, against the ISIL forces. And uh, so compliments to Harry Pullman for his, he's working his, his crystal ball. And uh, um, we've certainly got no, limited, uh, no limit to the amount of interest that the nation has right now in the topic of today's uh, panel. Um, as the president stated in a speech in the National Defense University in 2013, um, policymakers need to, quote unquote, discipline our thinking, our definitions, and our actions with regard to war powers. Um, the panel I have with me tonight uh, is well qualified to contribute to the debate that will be going on for at least the next month as the uh, Congress deliberates on the question of the AUMF. And um, uh, it's also a great opportunity uh, for me to, on behalf of Dickinson, thank three people who have been so uh, important to Dickinson and our community for so long, have made so many contributions to our community. Uh, Professor Andy Rudolevich, on my right, um, made a direct contribution as a valued member of the political science department uh, for over a decade. And uh, then one day, in the middle of winter, he got up and said, this place isn't cold enough for me. <laughs> and he headed north. <laughs> and now I think it's at least possible that every morning when he digs his way out of his igloo, <laughs> he wonders if he's made the right decision. <laughs> but we certainly are glad to have, have Andy back among us, and welcome back. Uh, Amy Godian, Professor Godian, 
um, has made many contributions to the Dickinson community as an institutional host for our Bradley chairs each year, um, as a research colleague, and as an insightful guest speaker on issues relating to national security law. And Professor Doug Lovelace has been a coordinator with, uh, a collaborator with myself and other Dickinson faculty um, for many years on many research projects relating to national security policymaking. He has also helped Dickinson students and faculty to access the rich human and archival resources of the Strategic Studies Institute and the U.S. Army War College. This evening, I will ask each of our guests to address aspects of the war powers topic. We will begin with Professor Rudolevich, uh, who will provide uh, some historical and constitutional background. Then Professor Gaudian will go directly uh, to the topic of, China, of Obama's AUMF. Um, and she'll be addressing questions such as what it says, what it means, and whether or not it is necessary at all. And then finally, Professor Lovelace will help us to understand how the U.S. approach to the use of military force is interpreted abroad. Uh, he'll address some of the claims that are made about the impact of our approach to military intervention, um, how it affects our national interests and our stature overseas, and he'll try to grapple with those claims. So without further ado, um, let me turn this uh, discussion over to Professor Rudolevich. And again, thanks for joining us. Doug, thanks you so much. It's a great pleasure to be back here, uh, back in the tropics, actually. It was <laughs> minus two in Portland, Maine when I left this morning. Uh, so uh, you don't have it so bad, really. Uh, just, uh, keep that in mind. No, it's, a, it's really uh, wonderful to be back at Dickinson and uh, with the colleagues uh, who shaped my career in so many ways. Uh, let me start uh, with uh, two quotes. I can't be Talleyrand, for sure, <laughs> but uh, let me start with, uh, with this. Uh, this system will not hurry us into war. It is calculated to guard against it. It will not be in the power of a single man or a single body of men to involve us in such distress. For the important power of declaring war is vested in the legislature at large. Now that's from James Wilson. Uh, he was a founding trustee of Dickinson College, as many of you will know. Uh, also, less impressively, a justice of the US Supreme Court. Uh, <laughs> let me suggest a quote from another Supreme Court justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes. A page of history, he said, is worth a volume of logic. I want to suggest that our discussion tonight is really about the intersection of and the interaction of those two comments. Uh, if we go back to the Constitution, we can think about logic. Uh, but I want to do that as well as go through that page of history, um, because I think they do wind up in different directions. If we go back to the Constitution, as I suggest, we uh, find a document and a, certainly a deliberation at the Constitutional Convention of 1787 that highlights the role of the legislature, of Congress, in the war powers. Right, a document that, of course, talks about providing for the common defense, that talks about raising and supporting armies and navies, uh, declaring war, the power of the purse, the rules about the militia, about piracy, the law of nations, uh, rules concerning capture on land and water, uh, and, of course, uh, the power to control foreign commerce. All of that is very much uh, in the minds of the framers of the Constitution as they think about how to set the balance of the war powers, understanding that yes, certainly the uh, president would need the power to uh, defend against sudden attack, to repel sudden attack, as they discussed, uh, but that in general, uh, the power of war was too dangerous to vest in a single executive. Remember, this is a group of people who are trying to make sure that they don't replicate the experience of the colonial era, where they want to avoid a second monarch, a second George III. So as they think about how to set up the office of the presidency, one of their main concerns is that they, they get it wrong, right? That they, in fact, give the president the powers of the monarch. And certainly, there were plenty of critics at the time who thought they had gotten it wrong. Edmund Randolph, the governor of Virginia, who refused to sign the Constitution, said that they had created the fetus of monarchy in this new document. Uh, but on the whole, uh, Alexander Hamilton, of course, maybe most famously uh, in Federal 69, goes through all the reasons why, in fact, they have not made a mistake, why this executive, despite the fact that they had set up a single person as the president, uh, against a lot of good advice at the time, uh, that this person would be hemmed in 
that the checks were sufficient to make sure that power would not be unconstrained, uh, that it would not be like the King of England. Part of that, of course, was the fact that the war powers would not be vested directly in the president, that the Congress would declare war, and only then would the commander-in-chief power kick in and make sure that the president had enough authority to, uh, to run the war only once it existed. Um, well, in a sense, there's your logic. Let's think about history. Uh, as early as 1793, that same person, Alexander Hamilton, was arguing in favor of presidential authority over war, right? The, George Washington wanted to issue a proclamation of neutrality uh, in the uh, Napoleonic Wars. I guess we do get back to Talleyrand, sort of. Uh, we have uh, an argument between the, uh, the colleagues of the Federalist Papers, the, the, the persons of Publius, if you will, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. They were on the same side then. They were not on the same side just a few years later. Hamilton, writing as Pacificus, uh, argues that the president has the power to issue this proclamation. It's grounded in the executive power that is vested in the president. And that, in fact, uh, the president can do more or less anything under the executive power that's not barred by the rest of Article II. Madison, uh, writing as Helvidius, he gets a much worse pen name. Helvidius is sort of a minor Republican figure in the Roman Empire. Uh, he argues, well, no, this is a shift. This is a legislative power. And that uh, Hamilton is giving the president power that reflects the prerogative power of the King of England. And so the argument, in a sense, uh, is renewed only a few years after it started. And this is an argument that really sums up the debate throughout American history. Uh, maybe most famously, uh, it comes down to the argument that Teddy Roosevelt makes against his one-time protege, William Howard Taft, uh, 120 years later or so, when Roosevelt argues that the president can do anything, more or less, that's not barred specifically by the statutes uh, under the Constitution or the Constitution itself, whereas Taft says the president can only act when he is empowered to do so by the Constitution or by the statutes that derive from it. Uh, certainly, presidents on the whole, uh, to borrow from a, another scholar, Edward Corwin, uh, have been happily free of any mistrust of power when it was wielded by themselves. <laughs> that, I think, uh, is a fair statement. So over time, you know, this page of history as it develops uh, really begins to favor presidential use of force, right? Presidents, uh, including Thomas Jefferson, who had urged Madison to oppose Hamilton back in 1793. Jefferson, right, when it comes to things like uh, using unappropriated funds to restock military uh, supplies uh, when it looks like we're going to go to war with Britain in 1807, you know, the famous incidents with the Barbary pirates, right, before Congress does come around and issue authorizations of force there. Um, more famously, perhaps, Abraham Lincoln at the outset of the Civil War uh, and after the Civil War, uh, all sorts of uh, roamings around in Latin America, Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, all called police actions, right? Not requiring a declaration of war. Um, world War II, of course, the lead up to World War II is uh, driven by Franklin Roosevelt and his executive actions in the North Atlantic, uh, among other places. Uh, the Lend-Lease provisions that are pushed forward before Congress ever approves them. Um, and of course, Congress after World War II was a little bit embarrassed, right? They got it wrong. The president got it right. This was something that we needed to be involved in. And so in that sort of uh, self-assessment, Congress becomes increasingly uh, uh, dismissive of its own authority in a way. It begins to give more authority to the uh, president. And when President Truman goes to war in Korea, he does so without ever asking for congressional authorization. He does so under the the basis of our treaty with the United Nations this becomes the, the UN war, not a US war, at least as he presents it. Um, well, again, Congress largely accepts that. Uh, we move forward into an era, really, of uh, so-called blank check resolutions, where Congress gives a series of presidents uh, discretionary power to act in certain areas, with Eisenhower in Formosa and in Lebanon, uh, and of course, most famously or infamously, uh, with Lyndon Johnson in the Gulf of Tonkin, right? Well, 58,000 dead American soldiers later, and who knows how many others, uh, right? The blank check seems to have run dry, finally. 
uh, in Congress in the 1970s, pushes back. Right? You have an era of, uh, of resurgence in Congress. Uh, the high watermark of this, in a way, is the War Powers Resolution, at least for tonight's uh, discussion. Uh, and we can talk certainly more about how the War Powers Resolution is, uh, has mattered. Uh, in one sense, it hasn't been enforced, right? Presidents have not felt particularly constrained about using force since the 1970s, uh, since the Vietnam era. We could list all the areas where presidents have acted, some of them that you in the audience will remember range from uh, Iran in 1979 to Grenada to Panama to Kosovo. Right? But uh, it is worth noting that at least it did lay out a couple of broad constraints that I think we might find useful to think about with regards to our later discussion about the uh, resolution that was offered by the president yesterday, um, dealing with self-defense, right? one area where presidents are sort of given power to act. Another deals with treaty obligations and or humanitarian obligations, and these are things the presidents themselves have talked about. Um, the big wars, right, have tended to uh, gain presidential requests for authorization, though I, don't, I think it's fair to say in no cases have they ever admitted that they needed statutory authorization. But for political or other reasons, they have come to Congress, for example, in the, the Gulf War, uh, the 2001 authorization for the use of military force, the second invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, was authorized in 2002. Uh, and of course, now we've seen uh, President Obama come back to Congress briefly, as it happened uh, with regards to Syria uh, in 2013. But uh, all of that suggests that there have been some constraints. But even in the current uh, situation, um, just a quote from President Obama's letter to Congress uh, yesterday, although existing statutes provide me with the authority I need to take these actions, here I am nonetheless. So I think that gets us back into a couple of questions. When do presidents feel they need to ask Congress uh, for the use of force? Uh, when has Congress uh, sort of stood up for its own prerogatives uh, based in that logic of the Constitution? Um, when have history and logic, that is, come together? When have they diverged? So I'll leave that question then for my colleagues to, to jump in and to start the discussion rolling. Thank you, Professor Rudolevich. Nice segue to uh, some comments now by Professor Gaudian on uh, specifically focused on the current, current debates. Okay. Um, so let me, uh, first of all, thank everyone um, on uh, my fellow panelists, but also Dickinson College and the Clark Forum. You all really put together um, some tremendous programs on um, particularly contemporary issues, but also really important lingering issues. Um, so I'm always grateful to be, be part of it. Um, so I want to play a little bit off of um, Professor Rudolich's idea of um, a page of history is worth, um, was it a volume of a volume logic? volume of logic, yeah. So when I teach about the war powers, one of the things that I do is I put up a slide of um, Article 1 and Article 2. And I have my students try and identify Article 1 being the powers of the president, uh, I'm sorry, that Congress has, and Article 2 being um, the president or the executive branch's powers. And I have my students try and highlight or identify just so we can kind of see a quantitative um, assessment of, of how many powers that deal with national security or war um, or the use of force the Constitution um, allocates. And, and on paper, it pretty much comes down. Uh, on the legislative branch. It looks like Congress is, is the branch that's going to be making most decisions um, that involve the use of force. Um, however, in practice and in history and in custom, those powers have been exercised um, by the president fairly aggressively. Um, I think I'll probably get this quote a little bit wrong, but I believe Napoleon said the tools are available to the man who uses them. And the president has certainly um, exerted tremendous initiative in this area. So the actual practice seems to differ um, from the paper powers. So we've seen, um, as uh, we talked about, the War Powers Resolution was Congress's attempt to kind of regain some control of this debate, of this dialogue, after their powers had atrophied to some extent um, during the Korean and Vietnam uh, conflicts. And so it's this attempt to reset that balance or that dialogue, and it says it doesn't change the constitutional structure at all, but really the, the premise of the War Powers Resolution is that a president who starts a war or who uses force um, on his own cannot continue it 
indefinitely without securing the approval of Congress. So Congress has to come in at some point. It either has to approve it or there's a provision that requires the automatic withdrawal of troops after 60 days or 90 days, depending on it, um, several contingencies. So the idea, again, was to reset that relationship okay, between the two branches, to provide a dialogue for information, and also to provide access to information, because that was one of the big complaints that Congress had after Vietnam. They didn't have access to the information of what was going on, so they couldn't even tell that forces were being escalated and um, that the conflict was shifting out of Vietnam uh, to other areas. So that's the War Powers Resolutions. Uh, presidents since uh, Nixon have thought that it's uh, unconstitutional for a variety of reasons. Nixon vetoed it, but it was passed um, over his veto. Um, I won't go into to the weeds um, too much on those, but probably the primary um, complaint or criticism as to why it's unconstitutional is because it interferes with the president's commander-in-chief powers that the president should be able to engage forces and control the conduct of forces based on his powers under Article II in the Commander-in-Chief Clause. And that also goes back to the idea of defensive war powers, the ability to repel um, attacks or respond um, to imminent attacks. So we've got the War Powers Resolution, and as I said, presidents haven't uh, always followed it. Indeed, they often submit reports as required by the War Powers Resolution, but they do so with language that uh, leaves open the question whether or not they have to do so. So often it says, dear Congress, I'm going to, uh, troops have been deployed in this area for this purpose. It's in the national security interests of the United States um, to do so. And I'm giving you this information consistent with the War Powers Resolution, consistent with not pursuant to, not because you've required me to, but just, you know, consistent with the War Powers Resolution and I'm a good guy in the office and I want to share information with you, Congress, to, to keep the dialogue um, going. So you'll see that in these reports to Congress. And again, most of the reports include information about where the troops are going, how many are going, and what national security interests um, are affected. So we're there, we're going along, presidents are submitting a fair number of War Powers reports, although not always, um, as we pointed out. And then we get to 2011, and we have the situation in Libya. And the president actually does uh, tell Congress that we're going to engage in, in airstrikes, um, but the problem comes after the 60 days runs. Right? The War Powers Resolution requires that after 60 days, the president has to have approval of Congress to keep the troops there, or it's an automatic withdrawal of troops. We'll leave to the side uh, for a moment the question of how you're going to automatically withdraw the troops and whether or not Congress is going to have the political will to require that. Um, but so a bit of a um, separation of powers dispute starts um, as to whether or not the troops have to be withdrawn, whether or not Congress is going to take any action to withdraw them. And during that time, um, Harold Coe, who um, now is back and teaching at Yale Law School, but then was uh, the legal advisor to the State Department, goes and testifies before the Senate. And he testifies and he says, we don't have to worry about this 60-day withdrawal thing because the War Powers Resolution and the automatic withdrawal section is only triggered when we're engaged in hostilities. It's only triggered when U.S. forces are engaged in hostilities. And what we're doing in Libya, it's not hostilities. Okay, it's not hostilities. Now, he says this, and he offers a definition. Make sure that I get it right. Where he says, this does not constitute hostilities. The airstrikes, the campaign, does not constitute hostilities because the mission is limited in scope. Okay. It's limited in the exposure of U.S. troops. Indeed, there's no boots on the ground. No U.S. troops are going in uh, to a foreign country. The risk of escalation is very limited, is minimal. And the military means employed are minimal, right? We're just doing airstrikes. So therefore, this isn't hostilities as contemplated by Congress when they wrote the War Powers Resolution back in 1973. So we don't need to worry about getting approval from Congress for this because it's not hostilities. So, a number of things happen in Congress, but, but nothing that, that triggers the withdrawal, and eventually the, the troops do come home 
um, I believe by the end of, of 2011. I'm sorry, not troops don't come home, the bombing mission um, ceases. So now we're, we're where we are now with Syria. And the initial um, presidential, you know, anytime you're advising the president, I'll be your advisor, Doug, you're going to be okay. president. Okay, so, um, sir, I understand that you would like to use force in Syria, that you'd like to uh, conduct some sort of bombing campaign, you might want to put troops on the ground. Uh, what I would recommend is, you know, we have authority, we always have authority under Article 2, Commander-in-Chief Clause, if there is a threat to our national security mm -hmm. and we're acting defensively. So how are we acting defensively, sir? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so we're acting defensively because ISIS has harmed U.S. citizens. Indeed, they've beheaded several, right? So we've got concerns there. They've made threats that they're going to attack U.S. bases, U.S. targets, okay? So there's a defensive, there's a commander-in-chief power. But we never want to rely just on that for the reasons that um, Andy laid out. So we also want to find some statutory authority. Okay, sir, would you like to go to Congress right now and seek authority for this, this use of force. Well, I have a very close relationship with Congress, you know. Good, yes, I've heard that. <laughs> so, um, okay, so it might not be politically feasible to do that then right now. Let's see if we have any existing authorities that we can go back to. Great, we have one in 2001 um, against, uh, at that point, let's make sure we have the, uh, the definition correct. So this is the 2001 authorization for the use of military force. It was passed on September 18th, um, shortly after the 9-11 attacks. The target, according to this, this authorization, is the president can use all appropriate and necessary force against those nations organizations or persons the president determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks of 9-11 or harbored such organizations or persons. Well, I'm pretty sure ISIS or ISIL several iterations ago was Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So I think we can tie it to the 2001 AUMF. We can say we have some uh, congressional authorization back from 2001 for attacking any groups that are associated with Al-Qaeda. Indeed, we also have a statutory authority from 2002 when Congress authorized uh, the use of force in Iraq, and a lot of this is taking place in Iraq, and we can tie it to some extent there. Well, then tell me, why should I not make a case for both sustaining both 2001 and 2002? Why am I backing away from 2002 but hanging on to 2001? Well, unfortunately, in the 2002 AUMF, some of the grounds on which we relied were about weapons of mass destruction and some other pieces that have since been discredited, so it might be cleaner to remove that. You don't want to get, get me associated with that guy. No, no, and, and <laughs> yes. So, of course, I'm, I'm moving a bit beyond uh, some of the legal arguments here, but there's certainly political reasons for why President Obama might want to repeal the 2002 AUMF. So anyway, so we have this. So imagine these discussions going on um, around the executive branch. What do we want? What powers do we want? What problems have we identified with the 2001 authorization um, against Al-Qaeda and associated forces. What problems have we identified with the 2002 authorization? Can we clean those up with a new one? Well, the Obama administration is going to try. So the new AUMF that they just uh, submitted uh, to Congress, and again, Congress hasn't done anything with it yet, um, identifies the target or the enemy now as ISIL or associated persons or forces. Then it offers a definition of what associated persons or forces are. Um, it also says it has a termination provision of three years. Um, it does not have any geographic limits, which we can talk about later, but it also requires some reporting um, by the president back to Congress, so it's not as open-ended as the 2001. Now here's the kicker. At the very bottom of the um, proposed draft that President Obama submitted yesterday, it requests the repeal of the 2002 authorization, the one in Iraq. It does not request the repeal of the 2001 authorization. So that still exists. So the president can now say, if Congress passes this, I have powers under my commander in chief uh, clause. I have powers under the 2001 authorization for the use of military force against Al Qaeda and any associated forces. And I will now have whatever powers Congress gives me under the 2015 AUMF against ISIL and associated forces. I think I'll stop there for a little bit. Before I put this, <laughs> before I put this forward to Congress, though, yes. there's a couple points in the wording that you proposed that um, refer to the war powers. 
resolution. Aren't I watering down our constitutional argument by even referring to these? Well, that's a great question, sir, and I know you don't want to acknowledge the constitutionality of it. However, I think the politically expedient thing to do here would be to frame them as reporting requirements, reference the War Powers Resolution, but you can also put them in a separate provision, which I believe the, uh, the new authorization has done. So it says this is a specific authorization pursuant to the War Powers Resolution, so it gets us some congressional... Consistent congress with War Powers Resolution. Consistent okay. with, thank That's you. still in the new language. Yes, it is. Yeah. But then the second piece, the reporting, doesn't fall under that <coughs> section. It's a separate section separate that section. requires reporting okay. of the authorization. And that would be every uh, six months. Thank you for your hard work. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and let me turn it over now to Professor Doug Lovelace to tell us, uh, to help us to understand a little bit of the international context of the debates about war powers. Uh, right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Pullman, for the opportunity to be here tonight, and thank all of you for such a great turnout to, uh, to hear my colleagues uh, talk about the, uh, the things that they uh, have great expertise in. Uh, it's great that this is a free event. However, there is a price. Now you have to listen to me talk, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you'll know that you paid a tremendous price when it's, when it's all over. Uh, what I'd like to do is maybe in the way of uh, putting a little bit of a capstone uh, yeah. on our discussion uh, uh, so far. And we've had a, certainly a great, uh, uh, a great presentation by Andy on um, the constitutional origins of war powers and uh, brought us all the way up to the war powers resolution. And both uh, Andy and Amy talked about the, uh, the uh, uh, effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of the war power resolution and reigning in presidential uh, uh, war powers. What I'd like to do is just pose a, a little bit broader question to kind of raise this up a little bit from uh, uh, that level of analysis, which is very important, of course, and just ask, what are the international ramifications of the manner in which U.S. presidents have exercised war powers during what I and others refer to as uh, the modern era of wars of limited liability? Now, what I, refer, what I mean by the modern era of wars of limited, limited liability are those wars that uh, the U.S. is willing to commit forces to uh, so long as the liability of doing so is limited, or st stated differently, so long as the cost of doing so is, uh, is somewhat limited. And uh, uh, I would uh, say that the current controversy over war powers has really matured during this period of, uh, the, or this era, modern era of the war of limited liabilities, which, uh, which I say started at the end of Vietnam and it runs through uh, to today. Some people will, will argue that no, the, the Vietnam War itself was a war of limited liability, but as Andy pointed out, it, it's hard to think of limited liability when you think of 58,000 deaths uh, in, uh, in a war. But, uh, but at any, uh, in any event, I think we can all agree that uh, 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 the, the uh, in introduction of military forces into hostilities since the Vietnam War have all been uh, uh, wars or, or conflicts of limited liability. And uh, Andy, I uh, mentioned uh, uh, many of them uh, offhand. I'll just review a couple, I'll tick them off real quick, just to give you an idea of what I'm referring to in this idea of war of limited liabilities. The failed uh, uh, 1979 Iran hostage rescue attempt, humiliation for the uh, for the United States, uh, the Marine Corps barracks bombed in Beirut in uh, 1983, uh, killing 241 Marines and forcing a very embarrassed uh, President Reagan to withdraw all the remaining forces. Um, a successful 1983 invasion of Grenada, which uh, still garnered congressional criticism after the fact. An interesting uh, a point about the uh, Grenada invasion is that uh, many of the students rescued didn't realize they needed to be rescued. The uh, 1989 invasion of Panama, which uh, we successfully overthrew the uh, Noriega uh, regime. 1992-1993 uh, military operations in Somalia, uh, which culminated in the debacle in Mogadishu in October of 1993, once again forcing the president, in that case President Clinton, to withdraw all American forces, uh, leaving the uh, relief effort, which was the original mission, uh, to founder. Of course, there was a largely uh, successful 1999 military operations in the Balkans. However, those were conducted under significant conditions of limited liability, uh, mostly a, a long-range precision strike type of uh, uh, warfare. And of course, there's Afghan and Iraq that we're all very uh, familiar with. So one of the questions that I would pose is just looking back at the, in at the uh, introduction of uh, U.S. forces into conflict situations during this uh, uh, modern era of wars of limited liability, um, um, 
would greater deliberation on the part of Congress have been beneficial to the decision-making process? And so I just kind of leave that as, an, as kind of an open uh, question. Uh, like Andy, I also have a couple quotes that I think might help us set the stage for uh, seven claims of uh, what are claimed to be ramifications of the exercise of presidential war powers uh, that uh, uh, help, might help us uh, understand those claims a little bit better. The first is from former Secretary of State uh, Madeleine Albright in her memoirs uh, when she was describing conversations she had with then Chairman and Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, General Colin Powell when she said, what's the point of having this superb military that you're always talking about, Colin, if we can't use it? And of course, at that time, uh, General Powell was advocating what some have come to call the Powell Doctrine. He never called it the Powell Doctrine, and, uh, but others have, and that was that we only intervene uh, when some people say <coughs> overwhelming force, and that's not correct. Uh, his statement was we only intervene with decisive force, and when a, uh, a discernible outcome or a definition of winning uh, can be defined. Uh, another quote is uh, from former Secretary of Defense uh, Robert Gates. This is kind of a long quote, but it's, but it's worth reading because it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a very useful quote, I think. Uh, wars are a lot easier to get into than get out of. Those who ask about exit strategies or question what will happen if assumptions prove wrong are rarely welcome at the conference table when the fire breathers are demanding that we strike, as they did when advocating invading Iraq, intervening in Libya, and Syria or bombing Iran's nuclear sites. But in recent decades, presidents confronted with tough problems abroad have too often been too quick to reach for a gun. Our foreign policy and national security policy has become too militarized, the use of force too easy for presidents. Uh, another quote that's a little bit uh, different from, uh, from these quotes uh, is uh, actually a quote from Abraham Maslow when he was paraphrasing Abraham Kaplan by stating, uh, I suppose it's tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. And, uh, and finally, another quote that's frequently attributed to former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, but I've never been able to independently verify it, but it's, but it's a fun quote, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it anyway. And um, where she has been rumored to have quipped that American foreign policy has become based on the application of military power, backed up by the threat of diplomacy. <laughs> and so, so anyway, um, many would argue that there is a confluence of several factors that have facilitated the uh, militarization, of, militarization of U.S. Uh, foreign policy, and most of, most of these uh, have to do with the accretion of war-making powers uh, within the office of the president. So what I'd like to do now is just to switch to these uh, seven claims that uh, I want to cover very, very quickly and uh, just put them on the table. And uh, then we, if you have a, uh, a desire to do so, we can discuss them a little bit more during the question and answer uh, session. The first we've, that we hear very often is uh, America has just squandered its goodwill in the world. Uh, and that America is no longer seen as a force for good in the world by many states and non-state entities. And um, to, uh, to justify uh, this claim, uh, statements such as the uh, the scope and duration of U.S. interventions have been seen as uh, unnecessary and excessive. That the U.S. is too quick to violate national sovereignty. You know, witness in Pakistan, Yemen, other countries. Uh, use of questionable tools such as enhanced interrogation techniques, assassinations by drone, reportedly causing uh, significant numbers of civilian collateral casualties. Cyber espionage conducted against civilians, including national leaders, as well as uh, rapprochement with questionable regimes and others are set forth as, uh, as examples as to how America has squandered its good, uh, goodwill in the world. In the world. And uh, all of these uh, as a result of executive, executive action. Uh, a 2014 poll conducted by the Pew Research Center shows that in nearly all countries polled, majority is opposed to monitoring uh, by the U.S. government of emails and phone calls and foreign leaders and their citizens. 39 of 44 countries polled disapprove of the use of drones to target terrorists, and that trend is, uh, appears to be increasing uh, day by day. Interestingly, however, the U.S. still enjoys a 65% favorable rating compared to a 25% unfavorable rating throughout the world. And significantly, uh, uh, I believe, for uh, for the U.S. position in the world and now and going into the future is the U.S. still remains much more popular globally than China, with the exception being within the Middle East region. Uh, 
So it appears a little bit premature to conclude that uh, the manner in which U.S. presidents have pursued foreign policies uh, through the use of military forces has actually squandered American goodwill within the global community. Uh, there's another claim that uh, uh, the manner in which presidents have uh, militarized U.S. foreign policy by the uh, over-application of military forces uh, has led to the end of the era of American except exceptionalism. Some people even claim that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the world no longer accepts the proposition that American can even have a, a leading say or a, a predominant say in making the rules for managing the international security env environment. American no longer, American no longer justify it on national uh, altruism. Uh, interestingly, the national security strategy that was released last Friday that uh, we were speaking of earlier uh, describes uh, American leadership as being exercised in a rules-based world, suggesting that it's the global community that makes the rules and not the U.S. But this national security strategy also uh, makes it very clear that there's a um, uh, great new great power politics game in play uh, between the United States, Russia, and China, and it's unclear right now uh, the, re the relevant roles or respective roles that these three countries will play in uh, in uh, uh, modifying, revising the, uh, the rules for international behavior going forward into the future. But I would say this, that uh, it's, it's very clear that China believes that it, it, uh, it played such an insignificant role in establishing the current rule set that it has the right, if not the obligation, as a rising global power uh, to, uh, to modify those rules more to its uh, suiting. So we'll see how that goes. There's also a claim that uh, 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 that there's an erosion in the belief that the United States is the indispensable nation. There's even a, a belief that uh, uh, the world does not need an indispens indispensable nation anymore. And if it does need an indispensable nation, why does it have to be the United States? Why can't it be China, at least as we go forward uh, into the future? And on balance, the global views of China and the world are fairly positive. Uh, the uh, Chinese uh, economic growth is seen positive by most countries, but interestingly, by many countries, and not an insignificant number, it's seen, uh, it's seen as a threat. Uh, another claim is that even some of our most supportive allies are beginning to question our methods, if not our, uh, our motives. And we are seeing some evidence of this. I was at a, a conference in China not too long ago when a former uh, uh, prime minister of Australia was uh, addressing the uh, group and uh, disparaging American foreign policy and praising Chinese foreign policy, which I thought, uh, you know, Australia arguably has been the best ally of the United States. Australia was with the United States in Vietnam, the United Kingdom wasn't. And to hear that sort of uh, sentiment from uh, a longstanding ally was, was somewhat uh, surprising. Uh, Another claim is that militarization of, US foreign, uh, militarization of U.S. foreign policy places Iran, North Korea, and other middle powers on a destabilizing quest for, uh, to make themselves intervention-proof. And, and, and they're doing that by uh, 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 seeking to acquire weapons of mass destruction. And uh, uh, there are very uh, informed uh, people like the uh, the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Education Center, who assert that, uh, for example, that uh, uh, with, with good evidence, and they make a compelling argument, that Iran will have nuclear weapons. I mean, the, the whole notion that you're going to negotiate nuclear weapons away from Iran is just, uh, is just a pipe dream. Of course, we see uh, Pakistan uh, is continuing to develop its nuclear ar arsenal increase. Its arsenal is continuing to miniaturize warheads. It's even... Uh, uh, exploring a, a uh, submarine fleet that uh, will be able to n launch nuclear weapons. Now, if you could somehow tell me why Pakistan needs submarines, uh, but, uh, but they are, are exploring that. And of course, the North Korean nuclear program just continues unabated. Uh, another interesting claim is that the militarization of US foreign policy kind of makes it OK or paves the way for Russian and Chinese assertiveness within their perceived spheres of influence. Now, when the uh, Warsaw Pact uh, dissolved and the Soviet Union disintegrated. Most of, uh, most of the world thought that Russia no longer had a claim to a sphere of influence. The Europeans especially uh, saw that. But we all see what President Putin has been doing recently. And it's clear that he's embarked on a path of reestablishing that uh, sphere of influence. And then finally, the uh, claim that I'll uh, put on the table is the claim that uh, the militariz militarization of US foreign policy leaves uh, those entities, whether they be states or non-state entities, with no choice 
with to resist U.S. Uh, policy uh, initiatives through asymmetric means, and the most effective asymmetric means that, uh, that we've seen uh, recently has been terrorism. And so it provides uh, sort of a justification for that sort of uh, resistance to U.S. policy because symmetric means fighting the U.S. Uh, in a fair fight one-on-one -on -one is completely in, uh, it's just uh, not realistic for, uh, for any potential adversaries of the U.S. So anyway, just by throwing, I'll throw, th leave those uh, claims on the table. Be happy to uh, address any of them during the question and answer period. And uh, let me stop here. Doug, just turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, I like very much this, this term, the wars of limited liability. Uh, but I, I would just say, um, while that describes a lot of the conflicts that we've been involved in since the end of the Cold War, what we may be may moving towards is the next level in that, what Michael Ignatieff calls uh, the moral hazard of impunity, uh, whether we're talking about uh, drones or, or Stuxnet for that matter, um, as it becomes more and more <coughs> conceivable and manageable for the United States to punish any country um, without any realistic prospect of, of retaliation or at least immediate retaliation or loss of uh, American lives, um, it gets us into some very difficult ethical debates that we're not even touching on yet uh, in this panel. Um, let me just use my, um, my chair's prerogative for a second and ask one question of the group. Um, and this relates to what uh, Professor Lovelace was just talking about, the statement in the 2015 National Security Strategy that, that anchors American foreign policy in the global community and talks about deriving uh, a lot of our legitimacy from the support of the global community. And yet, uh, the um, Obama AUMF proposal does not make reference to the United Nations. Any explanations? <coughs> Speculations? Makes reference to NATO. <laughs> mm -hmm. Makes reference, I believe, the term is something like regional and global friends or supporters. <laughs> Um, but it doesn't mention the UN. Now you can argue from a legalistic point of view that even making a reference to NATO uh, indirectly relates to the UN since NATO's preamble does anchor NATO's legitimacy in United Nations. But that's a, that would be a, a bit of a reach in this context. Uh, Doug, I might make a comment on that. Uh, uh, and I have, we have an esteemed colleague in the, uh, in the audience who's actually worked in the National Security Council and, uh, and I've myself have worked on uh, some national security strategies. Sometimes you just have oversights and you just, through the process, <laughs> you just miss it. And uh, Dr. Snyder, I'd invite you to comment on that if you, uh, if you uh, found that to be your experience uh, also. Thank you. So this, you know, for the to propose Doug? I mean, I guess I would say the presidents, when it's convenient for them, are very happy to uh, cite treaty obligations or, you know, other aspects of international support, right? Uh, you know, so if you go back to times when presidents have used force without congressional assent, you know, they have sometimes relied on the UN and resolutions uh, passed by the UN. And sometimes it's been on NATO treaty obligations. Uh, sometimes it's been on pure humanitarian concerns, the problems that the international communities identified in various places. I mean, Libya, if you'll recall, started in a way as a humanitarian intervention, right, to stop the slaughter of uh, Libyan, uh, well, civilians and military personnel, I think. Um, in fact, I, you know, in, even in Grenada, uh, President Reagan stressed that Grenada's neighbors had uh, demanded that we intervene. Uh, we had more ships than they did, I think, for the intervention. Um, and he argued, this collective action has been forced on us by events that have no place in any civilized society. Right, so there is sort of this, um, you now the War Powers Resolution, it should be noted, actually specifically uh, disclaims uh, the use of international treaty obligations as a substitute for congressional authorization. But still, it helps to muddy the legal waters. And I think that, uh, again, you know, when it's useful, you put it in. When it's not useful, you leave it out. 
Thank you. Well, uh, I think now we can open the, uh, this discussion up to q and I will have some good conversation here. Uh, I guess as you're beginning to move them around with the microphones, let me just ask if any of my three colleagues want to make any comments or responses to what they heard from the others. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to the question and answer session. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for someone to bring you the microphone. All right, now I got a question about the president, I and mean, he decides who is a uh, terrorist organization, who is a bad country, who is whatever, without congressional consent. Is that correct? Under the terms of the 2001 AUMF, that's correct. No, I'm just, I mean, this may be wild, but could not the president say the group in, separatist group in Ukraine, they're looking to, you know, to defeat the Ukrainian government there. Could he not label them a terrorist organization and, and use and then well, strike them like we're striking ISIS or whatever without congressional approval? Well, actually, so let me, I mean, the, so there's a couple points that are rise in the sort of successive authorizations that are put forward, right? On the one hand, you have, in 2001, Congress gave the president the ability to determine who we should strike back against, though it was limited. And actually, the Bush administration asked for broader language, uh, but the language that was passed, if you give me two seconds, uh, said that it had to be against nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th. So, when the president decided that we needed to move against ISIL, uh, one of the arguments that the administration made uh, was that the ISIL forces were in fact related closely enough to the forces that attacked on September 11th that they would count under that authorization. There's actually a, quite a lot of dispute about that. Uh, you know, an analogy you might think of is that uh, the famous play and then movie Six Degrees of Separation, right? How many degrees of separation do you have to be away from Al-Qaeda, right, from Osama bin Laden to be included in the 2001 authorization? Uh, that's kind of an open question. Uh, Ukraine, that might be too many degrees away, but, but maybe not. Well, I mean, I, I'd leave that to Professor yeah, Godian, perhaps. I think it became particularly problematic, too, uh, when in, um, I believe it was last spring, Al-Qaeda formally <laughs> declared that ISIL was not affiliated right. with them. So then that, that line um, became a little harder to, to make the justification. I think um, that's the concern, right? That that's the, the scenario. One of the uh, good ideas I think I've seen uh, came from <coughs> Professor Bobby Chesney, who's at the University of Texas, and Jack Goldsmith, I'm trying remember who else drafted. They actually, there were a bunch of law professors and they drafted their own AUMF uh, to deal with all the problems that they thought they saw in the 2001 AUMF. And one of them was requiring that the president explain and report to Congress on what groups he identified beyond ISIL as associated forces, why they were associated, and kind of explain the line of connection. And they left room for that. They, they said they would like some things to be publicly reported to Congress. So that all of us could have access to it, but they could also understand if there were um, you know, you reasons for secrecy there, and then it would only be reported to the relevant committee chairs. But I, I personally find that idea um, a very good one because I think that's one of the concerns, is that with language such as ISIL or associated forces or persons, which the new, the proposed AUMF includes any individuals and organizations fighting for, on behalf of, or alongside of ISIL, or any closer related successor entity in hostilities against the U.S. or its coalition partners could also be subject to attack. So I'd like, I'd like the president to have to keep coming back to Congress to explain why he thinks a group falls under that definition as opposed to just letting the executive branch make that decision. Good. Hi, thank you panelists for being here tonight. Um, so my question is, hypothetically, if um, Congress decides majorly that they do not want the president of the United States to, we don't, he doesn't want us to use military force on ISIS, um, what can Congress do to deny that if the 2001 still gives the president authorization 
Is there any way that they can get rid of the 2001 authorization? Or? Yeah, that's, um, I'll take this and then wait. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the things, you know, Congress has a number of ways that it can check the executive branch, and, and Andy started to lay out some of these, but the, the most obvious one is to repeal a prior authorization. Um, so they could say the authorization for the use of force from September 18th, 2001 is hereby repealed. Um, so that would solve it. Other ways that you see Congress um, kind of exercising limits on the executive's national security powers is appropriations, right? Putting limits on how money can be spent, both affirmative and uh, prohibitive. You know, mon this, the money in this act can only be spent for planes going here. Uh, the money in this act cannot be spent at all in um, Yemen or uh, Syria. So, so there's a number of mechanisms. There, there's others, too, that we can talk about, but I think those are usually the, the two. Um, actually, appropriations is usually the primary one that Congress uses because it will probably be difficult to get the political will uh, to actually repeal the 2001 yeah, so AUMF. In this case, presumably, we're talking about a two-stage process where first, Congress rejects the AUMF. Mm -hmm. uh, Obama comes back by saying, well, okay, then I'll go back to the 2001. And then the debate starts about whether that should be removed, uh, eliminated or constrained. Can I, it leads us into an interesting issue, though, because the Bush administration in 2001 was perfectly happy to get the AUMF. But if you look at opinions from the Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department at that time, they make it clear they didn't think it was necessary. Right. right? So in fact, uh, for example, it is clear that Congress's power to declare war does not constrain the President's independent and plenary constitutional authority over the use of military force. We think it beyond question that the President has the plenary constitutional power to take such military actions as he deems necessary and appropriate. And in fact, the opinion went on to say that it did not have to be limited to the targets specified, however broadly, in the AUMF language. Okay, so you've got the Bush administration which is claiming a, basically a prerogative power to act beyond the law in those cases, and in fact made arguments later in its administration that if Congress tried to rein in those powers, say by banning torture, that that would be unconstitutional in its own right because it would infringe on the President's constitutional power as commander in chief. Well, if you have the Obama administration has tried to move very far away from that philosophically, Right? They would like to say that everything they're doing is authorized by statute. And so the 2001 AUMF is very important to them uh, as a mechanism for making that claim. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that repealing the AUMF would certainly be something Congress could do. They could do it tomorrow. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily constrain president's actions under what they claim to be their Article II powers unless you also cut off the money. And even the Bush Office of Legal Counsel said that the power of the purse was something that the president could not go beyond. So that's perhaps your best bet, but the presidents throughout history have bet that Congress will not deny funding to troops in the field. Right. And they've been mean, right about that. That political debate, who wants yeah. to stand up and say, cut the funding um, when a fellow uh, representative or, yeah, or senator sorry. is saying, you're going to cut the funding for troops in the field right now. You're going to bring them home. Yeah, and they, uh, they, and and uh, you know that was the point that I was going to make also. But in this particular case, uh, where we don't really have large numbers of troops in the field, mm -hmm. uh, there's still this notion that uh, you know you asked the question, uh, what could Congress do? And technically, Congress could could you know repeal it, but Congress really can't because this nation, like many other nations around the world, are outraged by ISIL's conduct. And uh, no congressional leader is going to take the political risk of saying, well, just let them do what they want to do. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's just not, not going to happen. Uh, I'll just say one more thing. Um, when we talk, start talking about the uh, harking back to the 2001 AUMF and the resonance with the Bush 43 administration, uh, the wording of the, uh, 20, uh, the 2015 AUMF also tends to sound, to me at least, like getting back into preventive strategies, where it's talking about the intentions of ISIL to do harm to the United States in the future as a justification for why we can take action now. Uh, <clears throat> hi, I, I would like to agree with you about this issue about uh, for troops in the field in the sense that uh, that all of you are saying, and I, I think that's true, it's really hard. I mean, it was really clear in 
uh, when Bush 41 put troops into Kuwait and the, the war wasn't supported, but once they're there, you know, you, you've got to support them and, and there's this kind of inertia. It's very different though with the drone strikes and mm. the operations from the air when you have fewer, maybe no people, uh, boots on the ground. So there I think that spending authority probably has more weight, but I, I also agree that, you know, that's going to be a very difficult lift for members of Congress to say, yeah, well, you can't even do that, which puts us right in the back in the same spot, allowing the president to do pretty much whatever he wants. Now, the, the Congress could, I suppose, specifically become more involved by specifically appropriating money for certain kinds of things, and then they're going to broach into the commander-in-chief role, right? Mm -hmm. So it is, a, it is a conundrum, but uh, I, I don't know if you have much power when there's no boots on the ground. Uh, you know, that's, that's a, a very different kind of situation, I think. I guess to, to uh, one of the obvious questions that can be asked of, of the panel is, how likely is this thing to get passed? Uh, as, in its present form, not likely. Okay. You know, I, matter of fact, I would say it's uh, less than not likely. There's <laughs> going to be some modification uh, before it's to be passed. I think it, it's interesting, right? Because it's angered both sides, right? It hasn't gone as far um, as some would like it, as far as an assertion of power against ISIL, and so they would say there's too many limits on what the president can do, and it might start running afoul of interfering with the commander-in-chief responsibilities. And then there are others that say it doesn't have enough limits, right? It doesn't have a geographic um, boundary as to where uh, forces can go. It does have a sunset provision now, right? It says that the president has to come back after three years. Um, in my view, that, that's an improvement over the 2001 AUMF, which was, had no sunset provision. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's going to be a, a really good debate, though. And I think to, you know, I, sometimes when I teach in this area and I, I talk about, um, you know, what Congress can do and, and resetting that relationship, um, I, I come to the conclusion, and I maybe get some cynical about the war powers resolution and what it can do, but even though Congress doesn't necessarily exercise its powers under the war powers resolution, I think it still provides an opportunity for debate and dialogue between the two branches, and it forces a discussion that we're going to have now on the AUMF, and I think that's really important, mm -hmm. um, that the, the discussion is happening, that it's happening between the two branches, that it's not just one branch making the decisions, and that it's happening with a lot of media um, focus and press. And so I think uh, overall that's a good thing um, as we move forward on this. But, but I would agree in the bottom line that right now I don't, I don't think it has a chance of passage. Um, I think it will probably, um, the, the pieces that I think will need to be changed is that they will uh, get rid of some of the limits on the enduring, I'm trying to remember what the, uh, the term enduring is. Enduring offensive. Enduring <laughs> offensive, yeah. <laughs> um, combat uh, recognition. They'll keep the sunset provision. I think there's going to be a real debate about whether or not repeal of 2001 AUMF should be in this mm -hmm. one. And I look forward to, to seeing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I actually think something will pass, by the way. I'll, I'm not sure you guys are saying it won't ever pass, but on the one hand, it does make me nervous when leadership in Congress says, well, this will take months of hearings <laughs> and debate. Because if they say it will take two days, it takes months, right? So if they say it takes months, it's going to be, you know, a year and a half. And we've already been in this particular version of the war for another, you know, since what August. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I think there is, uh, you know, there's political advantage enough to be had from both sides here that something will pass. Uh, and President Obama, to a, in a, to a degree, right? He can come forward with something that puts limits on him, even if I think there's a lot of wiggle room inside the language of those limits realizing that a majority in Congress actually is in favor of removing those limits. That's a nice position for the president to be in, right? I'm going to put something up that takes away from my power, you know, at least on paper. Uh, my own party kind of likes that idea. They're sick of this. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the majority in Congress is not my party, and I can then count on the opposition actually making me more powerful. That's sort of a beautiful thing. I think it's going to be a really interesting debate because I'm hopeful that it gets beyond looking at Obama as the individual president and it's talking about the office of the president nice. and what type of powers you see there and i do think the way that it's positioned now it has the potential to to start that discussion 
Um, Don Snyder, uh, based on Amy's last comment, let me push this discussion a little bit higher. I would submit that what we're observing is probably round 40 of the rooster dance between Congress and the President since the War Powers Resolution. It's a power contest, and both of them have been willing never to allow the constitutionality to be questioned because they might lose. Mm -hmm. And then there would be permanent damage to the institution. So here we are one more time doing our foreign policy inside the constraints of an almost inane domestic debate. So my question to you is, is there any chance that this time we might get some resolution from the third branch of the government, <laughs> which might actually have to say something about <laughs> Article One and Article Two and who really should be doing this? That's, you're the law All professor. Right. I'll, <laughs> I'll start with that. I, I think that's a, it's a fantastic question, right? So in some of the notes that I, that I didn't get to, it's you know, what role does the court have in this? And a few times Congress has tried uh, to get the court to weigh in um, on this discussion. I think, actually there might be some more recent pending, but I think uh, Representative Kucinich um, is probably one of the more recent members to file uh, a lawsuit trying to get either the president's conduct uh, assessed as constitutional under um, uh, Article II um, or the constitutionality of the War Powers Resolution. Courts have said, sorry, that's a political question, it's a discretionary decision, <laughs> or sorry, there's no standing, a member of Congress can't bring this lawsuit. I would say that they've left the door open a little bit. If the question really is framed, as you're saying, about a constitutional grant of power, then that's a case or controversy that an Article III <laughs> court should be able to hear. The challenge is how do you, how do you get it? What's the, they, they haven't given us any guidance. They've told us what well, won't work, right? Member of Congress won't work. Uh, framing it a few other ways won't work. So uh, I'll be interested to see, but I think you're right. The court needs to weigh in on this. And uh, I, would, I would posit the court's uh, kind of developed a canon of um, avoidance <laughs> in national security issues that is not constitutionally required. And so I hope they'll engage. But if the court were to strike down the constitutionality of the War Powers Resolution, would we have to go back and create another one? I don't think so. Um, but that would require then that Congress and the President continue to engage in Work the appropriate together. debate <laughs> um, that is mandated by Article One and Article Two. I, I think the War Powers Resolution is a really great vehicle for forcing that to occur, mm -hmm. but by design, it should be occurring anyway. I mean, I'll mm. let Andy weigh in on that as the constitutional scholar, but. Yeah, I mean, the War Powers Resolution is 40 plus years old, right? So it's not a requirement of American history that it exists. It exists coming out of a frustration by Congress with executive overreach as it saw it in, in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos and all kinds of places in Southeast Asia. Um, so I think you would yeah, I would be surprised if the court weighed in, just to, in part because what would trigger it, right? If Congress, you know, affirmatively voted down, That's what you, have, yeah. you know, not even just voting down an AUMF, but actually voting against any kind of action there, right? Um, you know, doing what this gentleman suggested before, right? Um, and then the president did it anyway. Then maybe, you know, because part of the reason these cases have been turned down, right, it's been individual members of Congress yes. who lost effectively, so they don't have standing, basically, right, yeah. have just sort of come forward. The institution itself has not come forward. We do, of course, have the House suing the president on different grounds on domestic issues, right, at the moment. Um, I'm not sure how much that would transfer over as a, a useful precedent, but uh, yeah, the War Powers Resolution should be happening anyway. Um, of course, it's so poorly drafted in many ways that it doesn't uh, force the conversation uh, that it intended to force most of the time, but um, it would be nice if, yeah, resetting that balance might not hurt, to be honest, it couldn't, it, it mean, couldn't be worse. The purpose and policy, section two of the War Powers Resolution says, it is the purpose of this joint resolution to fulfill the intent of the framers of the Constitution of the United States and ensure that the collective judgment of both the Congress and the President will apply to the introduction of U.S. armed forces into hostilities. So it's just saying, hey, we've already got a framework. We're just reminding you <laughs> and putting some mechanisms in place to make it work. Um, yes, uh, the panel spent a lot of time discussing the impacts of uh, the war powers on United States politics and the Constitution. But I'd like to draw attention to Professor Lovelace's comments on um, the international reaction. 
where, you, where he mentioned that by and large the place where the United States use of war powers and our more militarized foreign policy um, is viewed the most negatively also happens to be the same area where said powers and policy have the most direct influence and impact, that being the Middle East. I was wondering if um, the panel had any comments on that fact. The, uh, uh, just, just a thought on that, the, uh, uh, the lack of a favorability rating of the United States in the Middle East uh, could, could very well be more a function of the, the fact that the United States has been the most uh, uh, militarily active in the Middle East as opposed to other countries. Uh, for example, in the Middle East, I mentioned that the United States uh, still has a more favorable uh, rating globally than, than China does. The exception is the Middle East, where actually China has a better favorable, favorability rate, rating in the Middle East than, uh, than the United States does. China hasn't been militarily active in the Middle East. If it had been militarily active, then you might, we might see a difference there uh, also. Now, of course, uh, I guess theoretically there were other ways to deal with the Middle, Middle East uh, issues uh, rather than uh, the employment of uh, U.S. and coalition military forces in the Middle East and were those other means uh, uh, pursued rather than military forces then the, uh, you know, the equation might be quite a bit different. The uh, United States might, not, might be viewed as favorably in the Middle East as it is uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, I have spent a fair amount of my time this afternoon with, uh, with a, uh, a general from the Saudi, Arab uh, Saudi Arabian army, very pro-American. Uh, you know, so when we talk about the Middle East, it's not the entire Middle, Middle East that is really unfavorable to the U.S. either. Of course, we haven't uh, invaded Saudi Arabia lately. But, you, know. Yeah. you know, one of the things about the, um, uh, the Obama strategy of pivoting to Asia was the implication was that we are strategically making a decision about prioritizing and that the future of the global economy and international politics is in Asia and so therefore we need to focus there. And by implication that meant we were going to uh, de-emphasize <coughs> Europe and in particular the Middle East. And we've seen what happens. We've, uh, the Obama pivot strategy has been pecked to death like ducks. <laughs> We have time for two more questions. Uh, thanks to the panel. Um, I think most of our discussion tonight has been on the tension between Congress and the President about U.S. war powers. I'd like to suggest a, a slightly different issue, and I'd like to hear what the panel has to say. Uh, it seems to me that the uh, Congress and the President, if you will, have has two baskets, if you will, to exert lethal force. One is covert action under the 1947 National Security Act. Uh, and the other, of course, is an authorization for the use of military force, which triggers the laws of war. And I'm sure all of you guys, folks, know that the laws of war are a very blunt military instrument because uh, there's a great deal of flexibility in terms of how those principles are applied. And what I'm wondering, I've been wondering this for the last five years or so, is that what we need is a new concept of a new uh, type of conflict where the rules of lethal force are much, force are much tighter, restrictive. And in part, this would be justified that the conflicts are going to be, most of them, since conventional warfare against the United States would be a disaster for any enemy, is it's going to be asymmetric, primarily dealing with non-state actors. So in that, looking forward, would one path be if Congress and the presidency could get together and try to discuss some middle model for the use of military, maybe going back to the concept of a police action, which would not be a covert action, but also it would not trigger the laws of war. And I was wondering if, what the panel thought of that, of that idea. If I understand correctly, Harry, you're arguing for both adapting military doctrine to the realities of asymmetric warfare, which is gonna be the future, but then trying to articulate more explicit guidelines and rules. I think the two things are in, con in conflict, I think. What's going to happen is we're going to adapt our, our military posture to cope with asymmetric threats, um, but it's not going to be, it's going to make it more difficult to articulate a strict collection of, of rules and guidelines. And the idea of, of calling it uh, police action, you know, that's what we did in Korea as a way of, of skirting uh, the, these war power disputes. 
Uh, the, interestingly enough, the, the Japanese government right now is dabbling with the idea of beginning to call counterterrorism operations police actions uh, as a way of getting around Article 9 of, of their constitution. And so I just see that trend. First of all, I see it as, a, as an inevitable trend. And second, I see it as a trend that runs counter to the goal of more explicit and constraining guidelines as far as how we do these things. You know, you do bring up uh, an interesting uh, point. Uh, well, you bring up an interesting point in, in general, uh, Harry, but uh, uh, you caused me to think that there are going to have to be some uh, considerations and deliberations of uh, what rules of, quote, war, unquote, uh, apply to cyberspace. We don't, we don't have that defi defined yet. And, uh, and, we might, and you might even say that we're going to have to, uh, uh, to do that with respect to space itself, you know, because the space is becoming, at least from what we read in the, in the, in the news, somewhat, somewhat militarized and, uh, and there are space capabilities, but we don't have a real definition of, uh, of war or, and the laws of war don't apply that much to, uh, or that, that much to, uh, to space also. There's also this notion of, uh, you know, we all know that the UN char Charter uh, is, uh, is uh, predicated on the defense of, the, uh, of national but also individual uh, self-defense. It's a defense-oriented uh, document. It does allow for uh, 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 preemption uh, as part of uh, national defense when attack, when attack is imminent. It doesn't provide for prevention, however, in the the way that uh, technology is increasing and, and the way that uh, uh, terrorism has uh, surfaced as a, a major asymmetric counter to uh, U.S. power, it seems like uh, uh, preventive war ha is absolutely necessary, you know, and, and of course, uh, President uh, uh, Bush 43 thought that it was necessary, and that's why he put it in his national security strategy. So I think there are questions that need to be, need to be addressed. And then, uh, and we're probably behind the power curve on a couple of them, especially with respect to cyber, and uh, and maybe even maybe even space. I don't know. At a very minimal level, your question links back to Jim Heffler's a little bit earlier about drone warfare and you know the the efforts, but so far successful efforts to push the administration to be more transparent about the criteria that it uses for targeting decisions. Uh, obviously, that's most controversial when it involves American citizens, but. More broadly, the uh, the lack of any sort of sort of input, um, legislatively, judicially, um, you know, into those decisions, that could be something that would get a little bit down the road that you're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah not and just all the a, way. and just another thought, Harry, that, that came to mind. We're on the cusp of uh, of a uh, a robotics and warfare revolution, and we don't have laws of war to address that, especially uh, robotics that are that are programmed with a logic and an intelligence for, for discernment. Of, uh, and so that's another area that, it, and you know, uh, some organizations, the, you know, like the Advanced Research Projects uh, Agency and others, they're, they're looking at uh, swarms of uh, drones and how, you, how we're gonna deal with those. And they're, they're looking at uh, uh, thinking robots on the battlefield and how we're, gonna, how we're gonna deal with those. Do you need a man on the loop, you know, type thing. So uh, yeah, I think you bring up, just that question really brings up a lot of a lot of issues that uh, probably need to take another look at. Uh, Professor Lau Nancy just mentioned the foreign policy among Australia, China, and the um, United States uh, changed like in the last few years and. Uh, we know that Obama made the slogan called Back to Asia, and I want to know why uh, Australia changes like foreign policy like recently. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question for me, please? Yeah. Uh, when you just mentioned the foreign policy between Australia, China, and the United States mm -hmm. changed a little bit like in the last few years. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, sure can. Um, uh, A lot of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the view within the Asia Pacific is that uh, uh, China's progress will, will, rise, will raise all boats, as long as the United States does not interfere too much. And, uh, and you, uh, you know, my travels to uh, 
you know, to Singapore, to China itself, I, I hear that sentiment a lot that uh, we don't want the, we know the United States is gonna remain a Pacific power. China knows that the United States is gonna remain a Pacific power. But we, want, we don't want, for, um, for uh, foreign policy reasons, for the, for the United States to interfere too much with the benefit that the entire region uh, uh, will, uh, will receive from, from China's rise, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, there are, uh, you know, w within the United States, uh, it's almost, there's almost a, uh, a bifurcation in uh, attitudes toward China. You know, um, uh, there are those who, are, who believe that China, that the, the obligation of the United States should help China rise a, as a responsible stakeholder, is the word that, that's used in the international community. And there are others who think that, no, that um, it's, the op it's the obligation of the United States to continue contain China, China's rise to the extent it can in the Asia Pacific. For many, many years, uh, uh, well, first of all, let me say one thing about Australia. Uh, every Australia uh, uh, head of state will always tell you that Australia is not the United States sheriff in the Pacific. You know, Australia has its own foreign policy. It's not an executor of, uh, of U.S. Uh, foreign policy. So over the, uh, the last, uh, couple of decades, you've seen kind of a shift in Australia because, you know, uh, uh, China is a huge trading partner of Australia. Uh, U.S. trade with Australia has declined every year for the past 10 years except for one commodity. Anyone know what it is? Wine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that is, and that is, that's, that's increased. And so, uh, so anyway, Australia has its own independent foreign policy that sees benefits of dealing with China. China uh, buys a lot of uh, natural resources uh, from Australia, and uh, Australia, like many other Asian uh, uh, countries, are, are are apprehensive that uh, an aggressive U.S. foreign policy in the Asia Pacific might hurt all na all nations in the Asia Pacific. our program. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thanks, Doug. Thank you all for coming.